welcome to Come Home. I'm Jen Mallon, and it's so wonderful to have you with us today. I am so excited. I have been emotional and weeping for the last few days because this week we have such a treat for you, our viewers. We are going to spend a week getting up close and personal and unpacking the life of a general in the kingdom. I was blessed to be exposed to her ministry in 1993. She was the, uh, just a force to be reckoned with in Los Angeles and around the world. And here I am today being able to speak with Dr. Michelle Carell. This week we're gonna talk about revival. We're gonna talk about the Holy Spirit, the anointing. We are gonna talk about spiritual warfare. We're gonna talk about the persecuted church. And she is going to share from her arsenal of experience. She spends up to nine hours a day seeking God in the presence of God and in prayer. She was influenced and personally mentored by Catherine Coleman and Mother Teresa. And so she has so much to give us. She was saved at 17 and set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Our precious guest today, Dr. Michelle Carell, has more than three decades of experience walking in partnership with Jesus, whom she loves, and the Holy Spirit that she adores. Her testimonies of the miracle working power of God and the, just the great adventure of her life in the Spirit are gonna change you, impact you, encourage you, strengthen you, and transform you. So you don't wanna miss this opportunity to learn how to walk with the precious Holy Spirit as your best friend and grow into this amazing identity that God has designed for you before the beginning of time. So without further ado, Dr. Michelle, oh dear. Thank, thank you, thank sweetheart. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to oh. be here today. I'm so privileged and um, you. I know you're going to just help us so much. So first, because I want you to just share, 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 tell us what the Lord is saying to you on your heart for his children, yes. for the body, for the yes. bride. Yes, well, we have been in a series, a long period of seeking God since before Pentecost that happened on June the 5th. And then after Pentecost, just for two solid months, we've just been seeking and calling out to God and praying and prior to Pentecost. And God began to lay upon our heart the burden for revival Oof. and that revival is coming and we must be prepared for the revival. In the initial planning of the revival that we felt was coming on Pentecost and the Holy Ghost came was just to begin to position ourselves by studying revivals that have taken place throughout church history. And the one revival that I feel matches best with the book of Acts is Azusa. Azusa revival was the most unbelievable. All the revivals, the Hebridean revival, the, the Welsh revival, all the revivals. John Wesley, who woke up um, the, it, both the United States and England, of course, yeah. where he was from, and all the movements that came out of the revivals. But I believe the revival of all revivals was, was Azusa. Because out of Azusa, uh, prior to Azusa, there was no word Pentecostal. Pentecost, yes. Pentecostal, no. It was just beginning. And the Pentecostal denomination, um, well, denominations now, yeah. was not yet formed. But Azusa brought Pentecost to the 20th century. And also the charismatics that came as a result of the Pentecost, of Pentec of Azusa. And that's your hometown. So yes. of course God would call you to stir those wells of revival up again and then share with others, yes. you know, the similarities and what we can expect. Yes, and one of the things I noticed when we were preparing is there are actually attributes of revival. There are attributes of revival. And what the first attribute of revival is, is how that absence produces agony. Mm. And I want to say that again. Absence 
produces agony. And it begins in the book of Acts when the 120 watch Jesus go back up into heaven. Can we imagine how they felt and what it would be like until the 50th day when the Holy Ghost came? Because after Jesus left, the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. Yeah. So there's absence. There's absence because they, they saw Jesus leave. And of course, God is everywhere. The Holy Ghost was there, but not the way that he is going to be on Pentecost. And so that absence, watching him leave, saying, will I ever feel his touch again? Will I ever hear his voice again? Will I ever hear the way that he broke the bread and remember those holy words? What are we going to do without him? They knew the Holy Ghost was coming, but they had no idea what was going to happen. And that absence began the prayer as Acts chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says they continued in prayer and supplication. And that prayer and supplication produced agony, longing for the Holy Ghost. And that's what we need. Revival cannot come till there's a sense of absence. Till we say, Jesus, look what you did in Azusa. Look what you did in the Welsh revival. Look what you did in the days of Miss Coleman. Look what you did in the days of the generals. Why aren't you doing the same thing today? And that crying out, that longing, but only the Holy Ghost can put that longing in us and that sense of absence that brings the prayer of agony yeah. that bursts the revival. Yeah. So we've, to see God's presence fall upon us, we have to be desperate, we have to be hungry, we have to realize we desperately need Him and then pay the price to cry out and yes. tarry. Yes. So tarry. position us, how do we do it? Yes, the tarrying is so important. You know, the Holy Ghost, He has to be wanted. Yeah. He has to be longed for. You have to long for the Holy Ghost, cry for the Holy Ghost. It's not that God isn't going to come and that you have to do all these long, drawn out things in your own righteousness. But there is a bridegroom fast that Jesus spoke about. They're not going to fast in the days when the bridegroom is with him. But when the bridegroom is gone, and that is that that actual agony that brings revival, that anguish that David Wilkerson spoke about, and that agony that is, that is before every revival. Frank Bartleman spoke of it. Um, all the um, intercessors of the Welsh revival spoke of it. it. It must accompany revival. Yeah. So how do we, how do people watching Dr. Michelle, how do they if they're new to this and maybe they didn't know, you know, about Azusa Street or, you know, William Seymour and just, you know, that they're, how do they cry out to God for that? How do they consecrate themselves, purify themselves yes. and, and, and create uh, an atmosphere or an environment for God's spirit to come? Yes. Well, I think um, the remembrance, if there are persons that remember or just the, the individual that just met Jesus to long for more of him yeah. and to be willing to do whatever it takes that, that the anointing will be there and be present in their lives. And also you see that perseverance. Let me just share an example. William Joseph Seymour's example. Yeah. You know, in the days of William Joseph Seymour, there were uh, very strong segregation laws. Yeah. And they actually prevented Christians from uniting together uh, the way God ordained them to unite. And William Seymour wanted the baptism in the Holy Ghost so much that he was willing to go to Dallas where the Jim Crow laws were just uh, out of control. They were just so strong. And be sitting outside the room not allowed in. So he could hear the teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, and he sat there, we don't know how long, it's not documented. He could have been there two weeks, a month, we don't know, but he was willing to go through that kind of humiliation just to hear 
about the baptism in the spirit. So locked out doesn't mean locked up. <laughs> that means when you feel locked out, like like nobody understands you because many times, many of the prophets, they did not understand. This is not a license to go and be a fanatic. But what I'm saying is that so often they don't understand your agony, your cry, your desperation for God. William Joseph Seymour had such a desperation for God that he was willing to go through that. And so locked out doesn't mean locked up. It means unlock heaven. Yes. Because oftentimes when we feel locked out, heaven is unlocked over us. And, and then he got an invitation to be a pastor at a holiness church. So he left there and went to LA, but God always has plans. And he was locked out of there too. And so often, as that was God's plan. When he was locked out of there, that's when the um, the Asburys opened up their home on uh, you know on Bonnie Bray, and the rest is history. Wow, God always has a plan if yeah. we don't give up. And, if we don't give up. And I, you 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 keep saying you know persevere, and the, the word is so clear. You know that those who endure till the end. And yes. that means resisting that which is resisting you. And so he, he somehow was able to press and push through. He had to something, an ingredient in him, I feel like many believers today are not tapping into. So you, you live such a, a beautiful, consecrated life. Tell, tell us how can how can we press in? How can we say, God, I'm not going anywhere. It doesn't matter what government society says, how I want you and only you. Yes. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit allows, he doesn't make, right. but he allows trials in our life. And sometimes we come to a place that we, we have no alternative but to start fasting and praying. Yeah. Those people that may have strongholds over their children, strongholds over their businesses, strongholds over their families. So I began um, the fasted life many, many, many years ago. And it just started with personal needs in the family area. Just fasting for my children or fasting for needs of people. And it just, it just became a lifestyle. And, and that is something that I'm not saying everybody has to live a fasted life, but wanting God's life and consecrating because consecration is a weapon. Yes. That's, that was the reason why Samson was so strong. As soon as his hair was cut, which represented his consecration, which represented his consecrated vow to God, as soon as those locks were cut, he was weak like any other man, yeah. meaning there's strength in your consecrated life. And the Holy Ghost will give you that power. It doesn't come from your flesh. It doesn't come from your works. Yeah. It comes from grace. One of the things I listened to the other day was your teaching on Nehemiah and um, how that led to revival, his set apart life. And you use the Hebrew word Kadesh Hashem. Yes. Can you just tell us about that? that I was fascinated. I'm like, yes, this is so good. Oh, yes. Um, well, Nehemiah was a man of God and he, he represents the kind of leadership that qualifies one for greatness, selfless leadership. Anywhere in the Bible where you see someone ascended to greatness, the Bible will always give a resume. Yeah. And Esther has a resume. She obeyed Mordecai after she was queen, just as she did when he was, when she was raised up by him, yeah. Esther 2.20. And the same thing with David. David's resume is very long. It's his battle with Saul and his refusal to use revenge. Yeah. And uh, Nehemiah also has a resume and that's the resume when he went before the king he risked his position his wealth his status in persia for the ruins of zion and he gave it he was willing to give it all up 
because to go before the king without protocol is the same order of kings, different, different king, but the same Persian dynasties, that in the times of the Achmanid Empire, protocol, if you did it wrong, you'd be dead. And he was not smiling before the king. And the king <laughs> asked him, and the text says, I was afraid. But he boldly put his whole life on the line for Zion and for the ruins of Zion. Because when they came back with a report that the gates were burnt with fire, he wept and he mourned. And you see that that report led him to a place of great anguish. And that anguish led him to be able to go into Zion and rebuild it. And that was what we call Kedush Hashem, that for the name of God, he did it, not for himself, yeah. but for the name of God. What a brave warrior. I, I love how you laid that out, that everyone has a resume. And I, I think many of our viewers today, maybe they don't feel like they have a resume or they don't realize or discern some of the things they're walking through in this season or part of their resume of becoming. And the motive, and you, you, you said that so beautifully, the motive is that he did it for the sake of Zion. Yes. And that's really what we do. Everything we do is for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the King, for the sake of the kingdom. Yes. And so help, help someone listening, Dr. Michelle, that to encourage them through their resume, to encourage them to get that focus like you have. Every, every minute of your day is so purposed and intentional. And it comes from the consecration. You know, it comes from the fasted life. But, but help, because I know there's hungry women watching this program and they want more of God and they're just sitting, leaning in. So just speak and minister to them. Yes, thank you so much. I would just say the biblical resume is so important that's always presented in scripture because no one gets a free pass to destiny. It doesn't happen, not even Isaac. He didn't get a free pass. He had to be tested with the wells, not to go into strife with the Philistines. There is no such thing as a free pass. So if we wanna possess the promises, we have to pass the test. And the test is always about character. Yeah. It's not really about the test. When we learn that we're being tested and we're being purified. And so often we, we're like Joseph, we don't understand, but we never read about Joseph complaining and we don't read about um, Joseph, any of the tears he cried. Yeah but yet we know he was so tested and we see the results of what happened. He becomes ruler over the land of Egypt. There are some people watching today that may feel, why am I going through this? Or may feel like, why did God allow this to happen in my life? And I just want you to know that God uses pain to train for greatness. Yes, he does. And that if you are going through it, just know a scripture that is one of the scriptures that is probably the most powerful scripture in the Bible concerning going through trials and God using you after. And that's Psalm 71, verse 21. You in verse the verse above it, it says, You've shown me great and you've shown me great and sore troubles, but you will quicken me again. You will increase my greatness. Mm and comfort me on every side. And that's what I wanna say. He's gonna increase your greatness. The Bible says, Lord, you increased me when I was in distress. Yeah, he's so good. Yes. He's so faithful. Yes, he enlarges <laughs> us when we're in distress. And it doesn't feel like it, because it feels like we're being yeah. crushed and smushed and confined and forgotten about. Yes. And it's in those moments that he's there Yes, and those that sow in tears are gonna reap, reap in joy. God does put a price tag on our pain. Whether we realize it or not, God values it. God says, you're not going through this, my child, for nothing. God says, I've seen your sorrow, I know your suffering. And God says, when we walk with him and we keep our eyes on him and trust him, then they that sow in tears are gonna reap in joy. He that goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed. That means your tears 
are seed for harvest, mm -hmm. seed for ministry, seed for how God's going to use you, seed for gifts of the Spirit, seed for destiny. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That makes, that makes us look at our tears so differently. Yes. Instead of resenting them or saying, why God and why me and why this, uh, to see them as seed, that, that's powerful. We know he bottles our tears. He tells us he does, uh, but it's not just something that we'll experience in eternity. We'll, we'll reap a harvest for them here. Yes. What, what, what's an area in your life that you have had to sow a lot of tears in, but now you're on the other side of it and you see breakthrough, you see victory, you see a turnaround. Yes, when I first came to Christ, when I first gave my life to Jesus, God allowed me to go through tremendous sufferings. And I went through those, those sufferings for the sake of the gospel. And it's very, you know, personal, but I never thought after that I would be that God would give me this ministry or that I would be called to the level of ministry that I was called. I thought I was just called to be a missionary in yeah. Africa, the old fashioned type. Yeah. <laughs> but I did not know that God was going to do this. And he did. Yes. Isn't he, he surprises us. He rewards obedience. Yes. And, and that consecration and the suffering. Yes. What? So many right now, because of the state of the culture, because of the government, because of coming out of so much um, uncertainty and the lockdown, so many think there's just no hope for America and that we are quickly shifting into the end times and that Jesus is going to come at any minute. So why even try? Uh, to go deeper into the things of God. But I know God's given you a word for America and he's given you hope for America. Yes. Can you share about that? Yes, I believe this is a time that God's allowed these things to happen so that he can call us to prayer Yeah. because the heavens are pregnant with prayer. And so that if, as things continue to escalate in the world, there's gonna be a protection over the people of God like we've never seen before. Just as in the book of Acts, when Agabus the prophet went to Antioch all the way from Jerusalem and prophesied a famine and they were protected from the famine, so is God gonna protect his church and his people through the Holy Ghost. And we should, we, we know what it's very, it's very gloomy right now, it looks that way. But the spirit of God is calling us to prayer, and to seek the face of God because revival is coming. Yes. And that is, this is heaven calling us to seek God and to turn to God and to pray down the heaven, the power of God over us. How I want, and I do want you to pray down heaven in just a few minutes uh, because yes. I think there's many that are watching, they need their prayer life to be reignited they used to pray, they used to tarry, they used to see revival and somehow their heart has waxed cold or they've lost the faith or they have shipwrecked faith. Um, but I do believe that one of your greatest assignments in this program, uh, Dr. M Michelle, is just to reignite that fire, that upper room fire, because we do need revival. and. The earth is growing, groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be yes. manifest. Yes. And that manifestation is this revival. Yes. So before I have you pray, because I want you to pray and you and actually answer this question and then go right into prayer. Yes. How do we connect the revival, well, the upper room to the revivals you spoke about yes. to today? How, how, how do we do that? Because we know God move mightily and we want to see it. Um, so can, sh t 
tell us how to connect yes. and then just reignite. We need, we need the convicting power of the Holy there Ghost. There you go. Okay. We need him to convict us. You know, not just to convict the sinner, yeah. but the Holy Ghost needs to convict the church. Yes. And we need to be so convicted. We, you know, um, the convicting power would hit the people coming to see to to see the Azusa revival yeah. in the train station when they would get off the train before they would come Gosh. to the place where the revival was they'd fall out under the power under the convicting power of God yeah. there is a difference the convicting power of God brings us to that place of weeping and only the holy ghost can show us our own condition only the holy ghost can put within us that weeping and that crying out to God. And, and we need him to just show us. We need to pray the convicting power of God on the churches. Yes, pray, pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray right now that Lord, the anointing of revival would come, that mm -hmm. all these wonderful people watching today, Holy Spirit of God, do what you have always yes. done from the very beginning. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, that which you did when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, that you would come and convict us. Holy Spirit, cleanse us. But Lord, how can we possibly give more of ourselves? How can we possibly, Holy Spirit, give more of our inward self to you if we cannot be convicted within ourselves? Deal with us the way you dealt with Reese Howell. Deal with us as you did when you wanted all possession, complete possession of his being. Holy Spirit, deal with us the way you did with Evan Roberts and with all of, the, of those who were part of the Welsh revival. Holy Spirit, deal with us as you did in Azusa. Holy Spirit, yes. deal with us again. Come, Holy Spirit. Convict us, break us, mend us. Let us say yes to whatever it is that you're asking of us. For we want to answer heaven's cry. And our release right yes. now in the name of Jesus, the anointing of the Holy yes. Ghost to come on churches, to come in houses, to come in families, to come on weeping intercessors that uh, lost their anointing but are getting it back yes. right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you would stir us up, Father God, by way of remembrance in Jesus' name. And we give you praise. Amen. And... Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you for joining us. We have Dr. Michelle with us again tomorrow. I pray you have rededicated your life to the glory of God and to becoming a fired up intercessor in love with Jesus. We'll see you tomorrow on Come Home. <laughs>